Well, that was everyone's grace minute. So if they come in and they miss some of it, that's okay. They'll probably just miss the introduction. Well, thank you for coming. Um, so uh, today's workshop is going to be about understanding the cost of open access publishing. Um, it is open access week. So happy open access week to all who celebrate. Um, my name is Miranda Fair. I'm the publishing and open scholarship librarian here at Towson. Um, my email is on there. Um, I'm going to talk a bit first about sort of the, the background of this stuff, and then I'll get into more practical, like how can I find out how much I have to pay or whether I have to pay, um, and how do I get around it? That sort of thing. Um, okay. So we'll spend a lot of time today talking about APCs. Um, that stands for article processing charges. And basically they're fees that publishers um, will charge an author or maybe an institution on their behalf to make their article fully open um, to all who wish to read it on the publisher's platform. There is also BPCs, which are book processing charges, um, but they're similar. They're just for open access monographs instead of articles. Um, I think they're somewhat less common just because more articles get published, so you see them more often. Um, what an article processing charge can be varies very considerably between publishers. Um, usually it's between like 1,000 and 3,000 USD, but it also might be nothing at all, um, which we like. Um, it also might be $11,000, which that link there just links to an article um, that it was like a nature journal that was trying to charge like $11,000 for a single article, which most researchers don't have. I don't think most people have that to publish. Um, that's kind of a, an extreme case, but um, we definitely don't want it to become the norm. And it, it did happen, which is not great. Um, so to understand like why this is, I have to talk a bit about the industry in general. Um, so basically, academic publishing originated a while ago from scholarly societies who just wanted to publish their findings. Um, and there used to be a lot of smaller decentralized publishers everywhere around the world. They were doing these kinds of activities. Um, over time, this is very, very like abridged history. They consolidated into five major publishers who they're not the only ones, but they definitely have the market share um, over this industry. There are still smaller publishers. There are still a lot of um, nonprofits publishers, usually based at universities like university presses and things like that. Um, and there's some that are independent, not associated with the university. But a lot of those got bought up by Elsevier and Wiley and Springer Nature and Taylor and Francis and Sage. Those are kind of the five big ones who have control over this um so i mean as we know they used to put stuff out in print um since basically everything is online now they've adapted to digital so i mean you can see where they would need money in the past to like print books and ship them and bind them and all of the costs that go into the actual materials of printing um but and you'd think yeah maybe they'll save money from just posting things online um but the cost of a subscribing to these serial publications haven't decreased since even though you don't really need print materials anymore a lot of them have ceased printing entirely um in fact they've gone up a lot over time um they journals cost money to run still but they don't cost that much to run um so i mean they still have to pay people who do formatting and they have to pay to host this stuff and all for servers and all that um but it's estimated that it's less than 10 percent of what they charge in apcs and what they get from that they actually need to like run their journal um and there were also some publishers who were like they call it born digital or born open access basically it means they didn't go through this thing where they used to offer it in print and then um uh, it's like switched online they were they came up in the 21st century and they kind of were just that way they were always online um they also adopted this model of of charging this um it's kind of a very brief history of open access again a super rich history um so the movement kind of became a thing around 20 years ago um 
there started with the these are the, I call them the three B's just because it's easy for me to remember them that way. The Budapest Open Access Initiative and Bethesda Statements and then the Berlin Declaration. So that was in 2002 and 2003. I pulled a quote from the Berlin De Declaration, um, which is basically saying like the Internet's changing things. We're going to be able to distribute all of this knowledge with everybody. Um, we can kind of break down these barriers and share things with everybody and everyone will have access to them, um, which is a very nice idea. And I think that's a mission a lot of people are behind. It's a, it's a mission I'm behind. Um, and this initially bothered the major publishers a lot because that, that's how they make their money. Um, and they kind of launched this like PR campaign at one point. And they hired this guy who was like um, worked with with celebrities on like image. And he was kind of saying like, hey, you should develop these messages to be like public access equals government censorship. And you need this to preserve the quality of science. Um and it, it didn't really work so well. And eventually publishers completely flipped their stance on the issue um, because they realized they could make money off of it. And then that's where we get APCs. Um, there were also some for-profit publishers, the Born Digital ones I mentioned before, that arose after this. Like Frontiers is a good example of that. They weren't around before this and they were always open access, but they've always been charging APCs. Um, and another thing about open access that I feel the need to add in just because we're going to be talking about it a lot. Um, they have a very non-descriptive taxonomy of the different types of, of open access there is. So I'm going to be talking mostly about gold open access. And I say it's that very intentionally. And I'll, I'll talk about hybrid a bit too, because I think it's very easy to conflate just like open access in general with being charged a lot of money to publish things when that isn't always the case. Um, it is sometimes the case. It's the case in a lot of these kind of like high profile things because it's a model that's used by the major publishers and that's what we're going to see most of the time. Um, so gold open access is this you pay an article processing charge. You pay in order to have your article published. Um, hybrid is very similar to that. It just means that a journal might have some articles that are open access, gold open access that you pay um, APCs to have your work published, but there might be other um, articles in the same journal that are subscription access. So they're not open to everybody. It's the institution that's going to have to pay. So usually a library um, to subscribe to it. So you can read. So if you aren't affiliated, you can read like some articles, but not all of them. It also means that the journal's double dipping and getting income from two different ways, which, you know, I mean, I feel like it's pretty obvious I'm not a fan of that um and the other ones though that we will talk about a bit are a uh, green OA which is basically self-archiving and I'll talk about some ways you can do that diamond OA which we also like which is um a journal that um it's not self-archiving it's like run sort of like a I don't want to say regular journal because hopefully they will be regular journals someday um like known as that um, but it's a journal that is open access, so anyone can read it, but they do not charge um, APCs to the authors. Usually they get their funding a different way. So it might be from a grant or it might be that they're affiliated with an institution that's giving them money. So like these will be run out of libraries a lot of the time. Um, or it's like a project out of a university press, that sort of thing. And then bronze, I'm mentioning because it comes up sometimes, but I'm not going to talk about it very much. Kind of the only difference is that's just stuff that's like freely available online, but you don't have these sort of guarantees that you get with other um, open access materials. So like all the other ones like gold, hybrid, green, and diamond are either archived or published somewhere where you will have um, sort of, or hopefully have at least a guaranteed of like persistent access to it. So it's archived safely. It's not just going to randomly vanish somewhere. Um, something that's bronze OA could, or you don't really know like what the archiving policy is. Um, the other thing is that a lot of the times open access materials are going to be published under Creative Commons license. Um, if you're interested, I won't get super into that, but if you're interested in learning more about Creative Commons, there's another workshop uh, exactly a week from today that will be about that. So that's next Wednesday, the first at 10. Um, these, so what these do is they have very specific like reuse guidelines for like how you're able to share and whether you can make copies and the type of attribution you have to make and 
like what conditions you're allowed to share it under. Um, so in bronze open access, that's stuff that isn't really specified either. So it might not be published under an open license. You probably just don't know. It's just like something that's on the internet that anyone can access. Um, so I kind of made a little comparison that's going to talk about subscription access, which we're probably more familiar with, and then gold open access. Again, I'm just talking about gold very intentionally. Um, so in subscription access, the readers pay to access it. Now, they might not pay individually. They might get access through um, an institution. Maybe their library pays. Um, in gold open access, the authors pay. Again, it might not be them as an individual. It might be their institution. Um in both cases, authors are not paid for the work of writing the article, which if you're writing articles, you know this. Um, in both cases, I just put peer reviewed. Of course, there's journals that are both subscription access and gold open access that are not peer reviewed or have very like shoddy peer review. Um, but this is more to illustrate that like just because something's open access doesn't mean it's not good or like lower quality. Um, reviewers are not paid for their work in either case. Again, if you've reviewed, you know that. Um, for subscription access, um, I mean, hopefully your library subscribes, you can read your own article. I've definitely seen um, cases where researchers can't get access to their own article. Um, I mean, they have the version they submitted, but it's kind of cool to see it in print. Um, then you can, you know, share it with other people. Maybe you want to print it out and put it on your fridge. I don't know. Um, in the case of gold open access, even if you don't personally pay um, you're responsible for coordinating payments. So that isn't necessarily like you have to hate up your institution and be like, pay for this for me. It might be where um, you have a, um, you wrote it into a grant. So you kind of have to like have done the work of like asking for it in the grant. Um, if you are getting it through some kind of agreement, um, which I'll talk about later, like read and publish agreement, you and you're working on it with a team of other researchers and you know your institution has an agreement, you need to be the um, author that's corresponding with the journal because they need to know that you have this institutional um <laughs> Sorry, there's people talking on some matches. Um, so another I don't know if you can hear them. I just tell okay. So um and also in both cases they privilege those at wealthier institutions and wealthier countries because somebody has to be paying for this so subscription access it might be the case where um the researchers can't access all these articles that they need to like do their research which isn't great um and it might be in the case of gold open access that they cannot pay to publish their research that they did which is also not great um so then Kind of the takeaways we get from this is that gold and hybrid open access journals will let major publishers maintain the profit margins that they've grown accustomed to. Um, another thing is that just like publishers adapted to digital, they are adapting to OA. And in this case, adapting here means profiting. They're finding a way to sort of live on in this new way of doing things. Um, and there are some critics of APCs that say rightfully that they incentivize journal publishing more articles regardless of quality to make more money um there are some doing that out there um there are also a lot of people who are just like anti-oa who have kind of latched onto this it's like a way to say like they're all low quality and there's no way to the only way to like preserve integrity is like subscription which isn't the case um there are other critics that also say they uphold and exacerbate already present inequality eh, inequalities in scholarly communications um i also say this there's you know less funded institutions now are at a publishing disadvantage when they were at a reading disadvantage in a lot of cases they're at both disadvantages which is unfortunate um, so you might be wondering at this point, I've just been kind of ragging on it, why publish open access at all? Um, and I mean, if you go back to the original mission that was, we talked about the Berlin Declaration, like it is good to be sharing this stuff, especially when a lot of this information um, and a lot of the research is taxpayer funded. Um, and if they can't even read it, that's not great. Um, it's also good for you as a researcher. There's been some talk about the open access citation advantage, which sort of like intuitively makes sense. Like there's if more people are going to be able to see your article there's more um likelihood that it will be cited um and there's been a lot of scholarship on this seeing whether it does exist i did find a 2021 systematic review on citation that looked at um a lot of this literature they found that almost half confirmed that the citation advantage does exist um like about a little over a quarter concluded it didn't exist um a little under a quarter found it in like some subset so 
certain disciplines it did exist more than others and then one study was inconclusive but generally it can help you out um the other reason you might want to publish open access is because you have to so you might have a funder mandate um so last year the office of science and technology policy out of the white house released a public access memo also called the nelson memo sometimes just the memo um and basically what it's saying is that there needs to be free immediate and that means no embargo and embargo would be like you a journal basically says okay i'm publishing this article you're not allowed to archive it yourself um for a year we're gonna have like exclusive rights to share this for a year um the term length like might vary but um, most of the time it's a year um so it's but if the work's federally funded they cannot embark on it um and this includes both publications and data and while a lot of these are um funding like stem research or in the health sciences things like that it isn't just for those all all federally funded so if you have like an neh grant that would be one of them um so it's saying most of the think they require by the end of 2025 but some funding institutions are like pushing for earlier so they want to start doing that earlier so some of it might be by the end of next year um and you might be wondering if you have a funder mandate if you're getting federally funded research um so there is a really good tool that i wanted to point out you can look this information up it's called sherpa juliet i like the entire sherpa kind of suite of searches search platforms um so this is put out by a um, uk-based organization so some of it's going to have like uk slants they have a lot of information about like uk funders because they've been doing this stuff there and in europe for a little bit longer than we have and they do it a little bit better than we do in the us but maybe we'll catch up um so what this one does is it's going to let you look up funder conditions for open access publication um does anybody have like a funder they want to look up? If not, I'm just going to pick one. Actually, I want to do NASA because no, I'm going to do the Natural Institutes. Um, there we go. So, um, it'll, if you search it, it'll get, and they don't have everything on here. It'll give you like funder information. They'll give you their website, kind of what this information is, and they tell you what their requirements are. So in this case, they require open access archiving. So if you have a peer reviewed publication that was accessed uh, or that was funded by them, you need to at least put your author's final version. So that might not be the published version, but that's the version that is um, like been peer reviewed. It's ready to go, but it might not be in the publisher format. Um, so in this case, they do allow an embargo still, but it is still 2023, so that might change. They'll tell you what the embargo is, um, and they're saying you can put it in a named repository. In this case, they're making you put it in PubMed Central. Um, a lot of times you can also put it, if your institution has its own repository, like we do ScholarWorks at Towson, you could put it there too. Um, and then once it's accepted, they want you to put it there. They don't have a policy like it'll say like oh you have to publish this open access and, and that it has to be in an open access journal in this case it can be in a different journal but you just have to put it here so people can read it um and they have information about like the policy now these might change um these ones seem like a little old and they might they might change once this like nelson memo applies to everything um but that's that's a place you can look up different funders um there are also other um like sherpa searches that i think are helpful because they're related to this um so another one sherpa romeo which i used to call sherpa romeo until they came out with sherpa juliet and i realized like what they were doing and that i i was wrong um so in this one you can look up specific journals or publishers um and they'll tell you kind of whether you have to like pay to publish open access and like what you're permitted to do um so Let's do is it imaging neuroscience in here. Yes, because we're going to talk about them later. So let's say you want to publish an imaging neuroscience. Um, in this case, it's an MIT press related one. Um, so this one's easy because it's telling you what the open access policy is. And this happens to be an open access journal that does not charge you money. If it did charge you money, there'd be like a little pound sign here or a euro sign, depending on like where you are, I guess. Um, so 
in this case it's saying like what license you have to publish under where you're allowed to put it they're pretty permissive because this happens to be like a diamond open access journal but what if it wasn't what if it was um educational policy yes yeah, so this is like a sage journal sometimes they'll have um like different ISSNs for the print and electronic version, especially if it's older. Um, so in this case, the published version, you do have to pay. There are open access fees associated with it. It won't tell you what they are, but it'll tell you that they have them. There's no embargo for that. It can tell you where you need to deposit so that you could put in PubMed Central, um, basically where you're allowed to put it. Um, and then um, in this case, sometimes there'll be this little like prerequisite bit. So it'll say like, if it's required by funder, this is like what you have to do. Um, and then it'll tell you what you're allowed to do with other versions. So in this case, um, you can, the accepted version, which is going to be the version that um, is going to be published, but it's not formatted. It's basically like a Word document or PDF that you have on your computer. Um, but it has, you know, been peer reviewed and been maybe edited and corrected. You get to maintain your copyright on it, which is nice because um, that's not always the case. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes they'll say you have to publish it under a certain open license or um, something like that. In this case, there isn't an embargo. So you're allowed to share this information um, wherever you want. You can put it in a named repository. You can put it on non-commercial social networks or subject repositories you can put it on your homepage. Most of the time you can always share it on your own website if you'd like, um, but you just have to, it'll say what the conditions are. So in this case, like once it's published, you need to link to the published version with the DOI. You need to include a statement that's saying it was accepted in this journal for publication. Um, you, If you want to do a Creative Commons license, you need to do it under non-commercial, um, no derivatives. So you're not letting anyone do that. So that's why they don't want you posting it on a commercial site. Um, and then they usually all say this, the submitted version. So this would be the version you originally submitted that you wrote yourself um, and that you can put it wherever you'd like. That's, um, it hasn't gone through peer review. Most of the time they're going to let you put that online if you would like to. Um, so go back to my PowerPoint. And you might be wondering, like, if you have to pay an APC. So we looked, and in some cases, there are ways to share it where you don't have to. I got a little ahead of myself and showed you some of the options on Share for Romeo. Um, there are some ways to get around that. So you can write the funding into a grant, um, which if you're at the early stages of a research project, you can do that. It doesn't even have to be a grant that's going to, like, the type of funders like the federal funders that are going to make you publish it open access if you're getting a grant from somewhere else they'll they know what it is you just say hey i've got this i'm gonna do this for publication fees um now they do vary it might be helpful to identify journals that you're interested in publishing in and if they do have publication fees they should usually provide a range or an estimate um that should give you an idea of how much to ask for um, the other ones that we'll talk about in a bit, um, so it might be eligible for a fee waiver or a reduced fee via read and publish agreement. Um, you might be able to self-archive to fulfill your funder mandate or just because you want to, which we talked about that a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is that not every journal charges to publish. That was just the gold open access we're talking about. Um, so some of the green open access or self-archiving options, there is ScholarWorks at Towson, which is our institutional repository. Um, you can also submit this to any of your co-researchers repositories if you are working with people who aren't at our institution. Um, you can put things on a preprint server. So that's going to be like archive. I should probably just show you these, right? Um, so we will go there. This is archive.org. This um, has been around for a long time. Um, they This is mostly in the kind of the list of like what... Um, so it's it's mostly STEM, but there's some finance, which is interesting. There's also some economics. There is another economics preprint server, which, yeah, .org. So this is research papers in economics. This happens to be a field where um, there's kind of a tradition of like um, putting your preprints online and maybe like annotating other people's or, you know, making notes about them. There's a lot of preprint sharing in econ. Um, 
Now that happens to be one of the disciplines um, where they put a lot of emphasis on publishing things in like high impact journals from like a certain list of journals. Not every discipline is like that. If yours is, um, preprints would be a good way to kind of share your work outside of um, who's going to be able to read it probably from subscription. Um, then we go to our institutional repository. So if you're not familiar, we do have one, Scholar Works at Towson. So if you go to libraries.towson.edu, it's on this bar here, Scholar Works at Towson. And it'll take you to um, MD SOAR, which stands for the Maryland Shared Open Access Repository. Because we have, um, there's other collections at other institutions, um, both within the, um, it's like a consortial repository. So basically other institutions that are USM institutions are in here, but some of them that aren't um, like Goucher and there's a few others that are in here too. Um, but this is kind of just ours. We have it split up between different things. So this is like, you know, undergraduate research, there's the different colleges, um, facets and like the facet conferences, the materials will end up in here. Um, it can be published, but it doesn't have to be. You can share stuff that you wrote, you know, before you worked here. Um, if you retire from here, we'll we'll keep your stuff in here, which is nice. Um, so one of the benefits of the repositories like this versus a, uh, just like sharing your preprint is that it is um, archived for, you know, indefinitely. We can also take a lot of different file types. We do have a file size limit of two gigabytes, but we can take you know, you can, you know, submit things as a zip file and we'll get them that way. Or you can, um, we can take like data sets, we can take images, we can take videos. There's not a way to stream video or audio in here, but we are able to host the files. So if you want to put them in there, that is cool. Um, there are also other um, repositories that aren't ours that you're welcome to look at. So there's another Sherpa search thing, which is Open Door. So this is a directory of open access repositories. Um, so you can find them this way. If you don't know the name of one, it's probably easier to just browse by country. Um, you can also like browse by disciplines. So if you go down to the US, there's 800, almost 850 in here. Um, so some of them are gonna be, a lot of them are institutional. Um, it'll tell you what software they use. This one uses DSpace, which we do too. Mo mostly with the institutional ones, if you aren't affiliated with that, you they're not going to want to host your stuff, but that's fine. We have one here. Um, there's some that are like digital commons, some that are uh, Drupal. So they use different, these are basically just different software. Um, there's some that are like aggregating, some that are disciplinary. So this is Ag Econ. Can we learn about this? Um, so it'll tell you what kind of content they take, um, what subjects they do, the organization that it's behind. This one's out of um, University of Minnesota. Um, what their open access policies are. So they link you out here to their policies. So this is the preservation policy. Um, so that will tell you like how long they preserve it. Um, what they, I'm, I'm curious what they use now. Like what do they archive it somewhere? Okay, yeah, then they'll talk about like the copyright policy. Um, yeah, they're retained indefinitely. They prefer provide long time access or long term access to the digital work. They'll usually talk about the pri uh, privacy agreement, deposits agreements, things like that. So you can look in there. Um, I just kind of want to see what theirs looks like now. I'm curious. So it'll link to the repository. Um, so in this case, this one isn't specifically just for people at University of Minnesota, even though it's hosted out of there. Um, and you can find information about agriculture and applied economics in here which is nice. So some of these might fulfill requirements if they allow you to put it in a repository. So you don't necessarily have to put it in an institutional repository. We'll be happy to take your materials, um, but you are allowed to put it other places. And because you aren't granting copyright control to um, these repositories you're putting it in, you can put it as many places as you want, which will help with discoverability because um, it'll make it easier for things like Google Scholar to find and kind of scoop up. Now, there is a new Sherpa search also. In um, This is in beta still. I don't know if I like it as much as the other ones, um, but they're basically trying to combine um like Sherpa Romeo, Sherpa Juliet, and then Open Door into one. Um, they do also have these other features. 
Um, so there's like ones about transitional agreements, which is what they call transformative agreements, which is also what they call read and publish agreements. Um, and then like well, they have this compliance thing that'll you pick a funder and then a journal and see if you it'll comply. But because it's a UK based organization, they don't really have any of our stuff in there yet. So unless you're getting a grant from a UK government funder, um, this probably isn't going to be very helpful. Hopefully in the future, it'll have more of an international slant to it, um, but it is still in beta. So maybe someday. Um, so that one isn't as useful, but it, it does exist. Um, so those are a few other places that you can still fulfill an OA requirement without publishing um, in bold open access. Now, some of them are going to make you publish in journals like that. If you run into that or if you aren't sure, um, you can always contact me. I'm happy to look into that for you. Um, but that's something that has to be sort of handled on a case by case basis. There's no like blanket set of steps I can apply to find this information in any case. I would need to know like who the funder was and where you were looking to publish, things like that. Um, another thing, which I did talk about a bit, read and publish agreements, we, um, they, they called them transitional agreements. I think that's what they call them in the UK. You might also hear them called transformative agreements. Um, I like read and publish because I think it's a lot more descriptive of what you're actually getting. Um, they are, are called transformative agreements, but I don't think they really transform very much, just kind of like contract language. Um, so what these are is they're agreements that are made between institutions. Usually it's going to be libraries because that's usually who's buying subscriptions to journals and publishers. So what it's doing is it's transitioning the payment to the publishers for subscriptions to journals, which is what we've paid for them in the past um, or we've paid them for in the past. Um, so now we're saying, OK, we're paying to have our affiliated researchers publish in your journals. And then the read is thrown in. So we both get to read. So that's the subscription, but also publish. So in some cases, they're going to cover the article processing charges, which is nice. Sometimes it's a waiver, um, which is good. That'd be better to not have to pay anything at all. Um, and sometimes it's an uncapped waiver, which is great. That means as many researchers who want to publish in these journals at our institution who get into the journal, they're allowed to. Sometimes it's capped. So it might be a certain number of waivers or a certain amount of money. Um, we don't have any of those right now, but we probably will in the future. Um, and then sometimes it's a discount. So it might just be like 20% off the APC. Um, in theory, it should be cost neutral. Like we were already paying sometimes a lot for subscriptions. Um, that even whether or not it's cost neutral to the institution, it's going to help out the researcher who's being asked to pay these fees. So that is cool. Um, we do have, um, so I don't want you all to have to pay money for this. Um, we have... One read and publish agreement right now um, with Cambridge OA. I will click on this. So because I'll show you where to find the ones that we have. So this is the one we have right now. Um, there are more in the works. I can't really say anything yet because I don't have final details. But I will say that the um, contracts with uh, publishers tend to be for calendar years, not like our fiscal year. So like there will probably be new things at the very beginning of 2024. So like stay tuned at the beginning of the year and I should hopefully have some more good news for you about other places you can publish. Um, right now we get an agreement through Lyricist, which is a consortium we belong to, um, for Cambridge University Press. So um, if you go to this page, unfortunately, there's no good way to link directly to our list. I really wish there was. Um, it'll kind of take you to this search thing where it's showing you like every place they have agreements with. So you have to go to America's, you have to go to the United States because that's where we're located. Um, it'll have all of these things. So these are the different institutions. It gives you like a whole list. We are here. So if you click that, um, it'll kind of show you what our read and publishes. This is the one that we participate in through Lyricis. Um, you can like check eligibility using this waiver and discount checker tool, but it also tell you like how to be um, uh, eligible. So this thing, this part's important that you need to have a corresponding author affiliated with the participating institution. So you can have, you can write this with people at other institutions who maybe aren't part of an agreement with Cambridge. You just need to be the one to submit the article using your Towson email so that they know. Um, 
and then kind of the other one. So the other thing is that it needs to be accepted um, for publication in Cambridge University Press Journal covered by the agreement. Um, the agreement also is 2023 to um, 2025, probably with some kind of renewal after that, but it might change. So um, again, these agreements aren't really signed indefinitely. They have an end date. Um, so that's the thing to pay attention to. Um, so you can't like retroactively apply this to a thing you had published last year unfortunately but going forward you can um so it'll give you the link to like yeah it'll make you search this again okay we're in the united states we are at towson university and you can click for your publishing agreement in our case it's a full discount yay um which is good you don't have to pay anything It'll tell you what the next steps are, and then it'll give you a list of like all of these journals. So you can filter by subject. I've been doing economics too. Okay, so there's like one in film and media. Um, in education, let's see if there's any. There's a few in education. So if you're interested in publishing in like language teaching, these are part of the agreement. Um, in this case, it happens to be like everything that Cambridge publishes away. They have a handful of journals that just don't have open access options, so it wouldn't apply to those. Um, I assume if they ever flip to open access in the future, then it would be allowed. Um, okay, back to this. So there are more in the works. Hopefully we'll have more in the future. Um, the other thing that you can do to not pay fees is, you know, we've been talking a lot about gold open access. This is diamond open access, which I did mention earlier. This is a journal that it it is peer reviewed. It's, you know, has an editorial board it has everything else that makes it look like it well it that makes it a journal basically but it doesn't really charge um readers or authors to um read it or to publish in it typically these are going to be funded by institutions grants some of them are like crowdsourced funding which is interesting um this is a growing model it's sort of relatively new um they do this very well in latin america most of their open access journals use this model um in latin america um, it seems to be pioneered by the Global South, which makes sense because they aren't benefiting usually from the gold open access model. Um, and you are able to find them at other good places to publish. The Directory of Open Access Journals is doaj.org. Not everything in here is diamond open access, but a lot of it is. I think almost like three quarters. Let's see what we're in education. Let's do education policy. We're looking for a journal on education policy. So you can do a search. It'll give you what they have indexed. So they've gotten a lot more sort of rigorous about like what is allowed to be in here. Um, so, which is good. Um, we want them to be very discerning about that. It is volunteers who will go in and investigate this stuff, but it's people who have, you know, like subject expertise about publishing or about a specific subject. Um, they've also got volunteers all over the world who are able to vet things in different languages so not everything on here is going to be in english if you're just looking to publish in english you can use this to filter so you still get 97 in just english um, it'll tell you who where they're publishing you can also um just see journals without fees um these are all so that you know got rid of 18 but we still have 81 to look at you can also check things that just have the doaj seal which is like a very specific list of requirements that you have to have usually it's um they have to have a persistent archiving policy you need to have um like allow right retention things like that um you can read more about it on here if you'd like but these are all ones that are not going to charge you so we'll just go to nonpartisan education review so there are no publication fees it'll have links usually to the aim and scope the editorial board usually the peer review policy they'll give you kind of a, a timeline they tell you what the rights are like what um creative commons license how long they've been publishing open access usually they have a statement to that um, and then they'll, they'll link to it. They've got like different keywords. So you can go to the journal site. If you click on publisher, it'll give you more information. Oh yeah. What else the journal publishes which is, or the publisher, what other journals they publish, which is cool. Um, and so a lot of these are again, hosted out of institutions, which makes sense because they have some funding they can give them and they aren't for-profit institutions. Um, one kind of downside to this is that while most of them 
most of the stuff in the um, DOAJ is that um, they aren't as well indexed in Scopus or Web of Science. I'm hoping this will change in the future, but I do know a lot of people will look at that to find places to publish. Um, so another fun thing about Diamond Open Access Journals, we did talk about imaging neuroscience earlier. Um, this is one of them. So I don't know if you all heard about this, but there um, were some, I believe it was Elsevier had like, which is one of the major publishers, published some neuroscience journals and the, um, so it was, it was just called neuro, oh yeah, neuroimage and then neuroimage reports. Um, they, it was at the whole editorial team just like walked out because they thought that Elsevier was charging APCs that were way too high and that it was unconscionable. And they did it and they left um, and they started this new journal out of MIT Press. So looks like they're doing a call for papers right now. They're getting it started. It's the same editorial team um, as was on these other journals, um, which is cool. Um, I just think it's like a good illustration of how it I think over time we've kind of come to conflate like this publisher with having high quality journals or like things like that when it's really not the publisher or anyone who's making the profit off it that makes it high quality it is the um the editors and the reviewers and the authors and the academics who are putting their time and blood sweat and tears into um making these journals what they are um so that's like a fun heartwarming story to kind of um end on um so Thank you all for coming. We did end a little bit early, but I do have some time for questions. Um, again, I'm always happy to discuss your specific case and we have time to look at them if you have like journals in mind or things like that. Um, and then I have my list of references if you want to do any further reading. But um, yeah, you're welcome to put stuff in the chat if you would like, or if not, I can take questions or I'll put my email in the chat. That way you... Oh, I guess Zoom has a new tagging feature because I started to put at and it gave me like a list of people who are in the Zoom. I just updated today, so I haven't seen that yet. That was fun. Um, but any questions or anything else like that, feel free to unmute. I should probably stop screen sharing so I can actually see you. Okay. Hello, good morning. Hi. I'm Perpi uh, Liwana from uh, College of Education, the Elementary Education Department. Yes. Um, will we have access to, I, I saw that you were recording. Uh, mm -hmm. Will we have access to that, including your PowerPoints? Yeah. So I'll email that out. I have a colleague who very kindly goes through and captions it and prepares it for YouTube. Um, so I don't have to do that. So I'll send her this and she'll just need time to do it, but I'll email it to everybody who registered. So I know there were a few who like ended up not being able to make it. Um, but if you missed any, if you missed the beginning, you'll have access to all this stuff. Thank I'll, you so I'll much. Cut out, have yeah. her cut out the Q and A though. So I'll just add my <laughs> stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. Because I also was going to go ask, I know you talked about journals and um, uh, a lot of those repositories, but I wonder about um, publishing textbooks. Um, oh, like doing like yeah, open access in terms of uh, creating that because my colleagues and I are interested. We did already a um, uh, an initial um, search uh, as part of uh, the FACET uh, OER uh, funding. And we really mm -hmm. saw that one of the need uh, is 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 in, in literacy assessments. We're looking at literacy assessments and we're interested in looking at uh, possibilities later on to uh, do publications uh, textbook because we know our students in terms of the needs but this, of course it's a it's a big goal but we were wondering areas for for publishing uh, in, in this uh, again a book maybe an edited book and then we have multiple uh, authors to address the needs of what we're looking at any um, resource in that so um is it is it like a is it a textbook you're looking to publish or just like a book? You're all like writing chapters. You're going to do an edited volume. We don't know, but it, that's, it's something like that because we mm -hmm. are 
looking at uh, areas and, and we are not seeing anything. And if there are some there that are out there, because uh, I know we looked at open stacks and all those other uh, areas, but they're not uh, specific to our needs and to our students' needs. So we were thinking uh, if we can cater it to that uh but where we can publish it is another area. Maybe we can start small. And I saw Scholar Works uh, at Towson to just uh, small, small stuff for student needs. But uh, I also saw that in other universities, they have those uh, uh, publishers who are publishing uh, that particular work. But any any thoughts on that? Any research? Because we pretty much don't know much about it. Yeah, so um, we don't have like a university press here. Um, it'd be cool if we did. We do have um, uh, OJS, which is like Open Journal Services. Now that doesn't host books. I just realized I'm not screen sharing anymore. You probably want to see what I'm looking at. So um, here's like our Open Journals tapestry from your colleagues in the College of Education, um, which is kind of getting started. Um, and then we also host the Languages Gazette. Um, so you're actually the second person I've heard from that had an interest in like a monograph. So there is also another like thing, platform that this um, like PKP, which is the Public Knowledge Project, puts out these platforms. Um, they're like open source so anyone can can uh like use them and get them now we do have our library it department that works very hard to maintain this stuff and it's definitely not easy but i know we had been talking a bit about getting open monograph services in order to like um host books and i think somebody else was asking about that too um so hopefully now that two people are asking, I have a case to um, see if they will let me do that. Because um, I could have managed the platform, but I don't really manage the journals in that sense. There are also, I think it's, is it DOA Books? I wish it was the same as, so there's like a directory of open access books. That might be where you like specifically look for books, but you could see like what the platforms are. Um I do also know that there are some university presses that are getting into open access books. I know um, like University of Michigan Press does them. Um, so it might be like a different university press that would allow that. Um, I will look into it, though, and I'll like... I will I will get back to you. I think I have your email from when you registered for this. Yes, yes um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll see like what might work for that specifically. And then you were talking about doing it as like an OER textbook. I know what's nice about those is that sometimes they'll have authoring platforms built in. So you can just write the stuff in there and then share it. But it does seem to be that the biggest challenge with this sort of thing is like, where do we put them? Like once we've created this thing, where does it live? And where does it live that I'm confident that it isn't just going to disappear someday? Um, so I know the benefit of this and the benefit of using public knowledge project stuff is that, here, I'll click on this. So, oh, I was kind of hoping it would go to, it's just, it's just PKP. Don't. Oh, okay. This is about the open journal system. So I know they have open monograph system. Um, they have their own like archiving thing. So basically if something happens to this website, it like, um, they, they have like a server up there that will like um, keep it basically. Okay, well, it doesn't want to show up for me right now. <laughs> Open monographs, PK. See how bad I am at searching. Oh, it's OMP. It's Open Monograph Press, not OMS. It's too many um, acronyms, but we know that from being at a university, that there's always too many acronyms. Um, but I will look and see like what, what is good for education specifically. That was a good question, though. Any more questions or anything else you want to talk about? If not, I can give you 11 minutes of your life back. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the applause. I will stop sharing again. <laughs>